And now, ladies and gentlemen, we will begin session two under the theme of transforming the DMZ into a green and peace zone, vision and challenges. So this is the time for us to look into the concept as well as the challenges and tasks. And let me now invite the moderator as well as the panelists up on stage. Please welcome them with a big round of applause. Thank you. Please be seated. So everyone is seated now. Let us now begin the second session of the forum today, and I will hand over the microphone to the moderator. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am uh, serving as an honorary professor at Ihua Women's University. My name is Daesok Choi. Uh, t this year, we are having the second, the, the fifth edition of the Greenpeace Zone DMZ Global Forum uh, 2022. The title of the forum t this year is Promoting Green Detangte Through the Transformation of the DMZ into the G Greenpeace Zone. The inter Korean rea relations have gone through ups and downs marked by confrontation and easing of tension, and then to be followed by confrontation again. As a matter of fact, I understand that peace on the Korean Peninsula uh, should be a daily necessity for us, but sometimes uh, it feels like a luxury item for us. But definitely, without a doubt, peace should be a part of our daily lives. It should be one of the goods that we use as daily necessities. The theme of the second session is uh, transforming the DMZ into a green peace zone. Instead of the Korean Peninsula uh, that is satisfied with the uh, discontinuation of the war, we should become more proactive in order to uh, build more stable and lasting peace and ultimately achieve reunification of the two Koreas. And it is on that note that I would like to begin the second session uh, geared towards our efforts to build more proactive peace on the peninsula. The second session will run for about two hours and we'll hear from four speakers and four discussions. Uh, starting uh, from my left hand side, let me introduce our speakers today. Sitting right next to me is from Hyundai Research Institute, uh, Dr. Hae Jung Lee. Please welcome her with a round of applause. The second presenter, uh, will be joining us from China, Nanjing University, Professor Zhu Feng. Uh, Professor Feng is joining us online via the internet. Uh, why don't we give him a round of applause? Uh, Professor Zhu Feng, as you must be well aware, uh, is uh, teaching at uh, Nanjing University, and he is an acclaimed international political scientist in China. Uh, next is Mr. Kai Frobel from German Federation for the Environment and Nature Conservation. He will share his examples from Germany uh, for Green Dekante. The last speaker today is uh, from the Korea Maritime Institute. Uh, Dr. Jung Ho Nam is with us today as well. He will have a presentation regarding the development of the Han River estuary. We are joined by four discussions today, and uh, we have a, a number of participants for this session uh, from Jin Che uh, from the China University of Political Science and Law. He studied at the Korea University, so he must be proficient in Korean as well. Yes, he's joining us online as well. And next, 
Uh, from the National Human Resources Development Institute, we have with us Dr. Kang Woo Lee. He received his PhD uh, on this uh, topic that we are addressing today. Next discussant is uh, Professor Young Sun Chun from the Gangguk University of Korea. Uh, regarding inter-Korean exchange in North Korean literature, he has abundant expertise in those areas. Last but not least, Dr. Jung Hun Lee from the Gyeonggi Research Institute is with us today for discussions. He majored in geology. As such, uh, he will probably uh, have a rather fresh approach to the topic today from uh, the perspective of ge geology. I will give each speaker 15 minutes for their presentations and for each discussant, uh, seven minutes each. And after the discussion by four discussants, uh, speakers will have a chance to address and respond to the questions posed by discussants. And towards the end of the session, we will be ready to take the questions from the floor uh, or from online. Those of you who have questions, please write down your questions on a piece of paper so that I can read the questions for you towards the participants. Now let us hear first from Dr. He Jung Lee from the Hyundai Research Institute. Uh, 15 minutes, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Hye Jung Lee from the Hyundai Economic Research Institute. It is a great honor for me to be able to share my thoughts with such excellent participants today. So I would like to thank the Unification Ministry. Now today I would like to share with you the topic of the Green and Peace Zone Vision and Implications. So I would like to discuss in the order of the vision and implications and the foundation for the GPZ and future challenges. Now, in the previous session, we talked about the green detente. Then the concept of the green detente, now this was included as part of the national agenda. Do you believe that this would be the first time? As you can see in this table, that is not so. Yes, the current government, Yoon song yeol government, is implementing the green detente policy. And as we have heard in the first session, this is in reflection of the issues of the time, for example, climate change and also environmental protection. And then also to shift from the existing uh, military or defense security more to the uh, less uh, hard topics, uh, for example, non-infectious uh, disease control or forest pest and so forth and the end goal is to seek shared prosperity and peace and also in the first session it was mentioned that the north korea policy in the end is a relay so in order to respond to this complex crisis which is the korean peninsula situation the current government is also trying to carry on with the unification policies of the past. So for example, environmental protection and natural disasters. So the issue is not only for the Tukers, but also for the international community. So they are included. And then also, for example, forced cooperation and also the GPZ in the DMZ. So these are part of the national agenda today. But now, In the previous government, now under the Lee Myung Bak government, now we they also included the term Green Korean Peninsula as part of the green uh, or part of the economic policy. And then also under the Park Geun Hye government, they also talked about green detente as part of the unification policy. And under the Yoon Suk Yeol government, it also talks about the green detente between North and South Koreas as a way to prepare for unification together with the people. Now, this is about the DMZ, and as we are able to see in the video, the 
there is the demilitarized zone and this is this thing the so there is the DMZ and then there's also the civilian control line as well as the military demarcation line so now this is the space definition so from the south to the north so it is two kilometers to each side so it is four kilometers wide now from the Imjin River estuary to the east coast it is total 248 kilometers long and as it says here it is about 1.5 times the total area of the city of Seoul and the Han River estuary neutral region all the way to the so this is from the Imjin River estuary to the end of the Gangwado Island and this is actually the area that were used by the two Koreas is allowed which is a bit different from the DMZ which is off limits to both the northern and southern civilians so now then let me talk a bit about the vision implications of the GPZ in the DMZ so now the DMZ as GPZ now this did not come from nowhere so you can see that from the 1954 there were discussions about the need to have an ecological survey of this area and then now in 1971 uh, Mr. Rogers from the Military Armistice Committee made an official proposal and then also at several times in the past there were proposals of turning this into an ecological park or a peace park there have also been international discussions as well so this is not solely a domestic issue but then it also has received a lot of international attention but it was never easy to reach an agreement between the two Koreas so the first was in the 1994 so it was in the framework agreement under the Noteo government in article 12 it included the peaceful use of the DMZ and since then there have been a number of proposals of turning this into an ecological park or a peace park and now all the way to the Yoon Sung Yeol government today which has proposed the green detente for the two Koreas or having DMZ as the GPZ now then what would be the meaning or implications of the green and peace zone now for the ecology and environment and tourism so there can be cooperation in these three areas in order to ease tension on the Korean Peninsula so that would be the ultimate goal so as was mentioned earlier if the DMZ was the symbol of disconnection and division now we need to turn this into a symbol of peace and communication so if we can have cooperation over the DMZ then we could try to enhance the national economy and also try to improve the lives of the people in the region but more immediately we can work together for practical purposes for example to prevent infectious diseases and wildfires as well as natural disasters and then we can continue working together on various fronts like the ecological, environmental, and tourism cooperation. And of course, in order to carry on with this cooperation, we need to have endorsement from the international society. And such cooperation would also go a long way toward improving the quality of life of the local residents. And in the end, it would also contribute to growing the economy and uh, having more balanced development of the Korean Peninsula. Now then, how can we lay the foundation for the GPZ in the DMZ? As I mentioned earlier, there has been some agreement regarding this. So there was the framework agreement, and then now we also need to have more uh, technical details agreed. And regarding the border region now at the from the 17th National Assembly, 
but there have been discussions only and no major legislations have been made yet. So I do believe that we also need to come up with the right legislation to further promote the efforts. And another element that we need is to encourage response from the North Korean side. So as was mentioned in the earlier session, we also need to listen to the other side's story, what is their needs, what are their interests. So for the environmental cooperation and prevention of infectious diseases, so in order to have cooperation on the infectious control, healthcare, so these would be some of the interest areas and also joint discovery of remains could also be some of the issues that could solicit response from North Korea. Having said that, lacking immediate response, we should not be discouraged, but we can move ahead with some of the projects or programs that we can do on our own and continue to work on projects that can be done together. And also to make sure that we can have cooperation that would benefit both sides. And we also need to make sure that we have the right projects. And if we can look into the North Korean interests based on their VNR, then we see that what they are interested in are tourism in Gangwon province and ecological tourism and diversity preservation. So they are part of the VNR that have been submitted by North Korea. So I believe that they give some ideas about the areas of interest by North Korea. So perhaps we can base our cooperation on these issues. And this was also briefly mentioned earlier, and that is about the roles and the responsibilities between the central government as well as the local authorities, and also the interest and agreement from the local residents because they are the direct stakeholders. So we also need to make sure that we gain their understanding and agreement. And now these are some of the plans by the central government as well as the local authorities. And we need to make sure that they do not overlap with each other. And we have to make sure that they, they are all moving toward the same goal in order to maximize the resulting benefits. And also regarding the DMZ and also having DMZ as a GPZ, then the most important issue would be the jurisdiction. So we need to start from the points where there can be a balance between the UN command's jurisdiction and uh, administration by the two Koreas. So perhaps, so when we were having the Kaesang Industrial Complex, they had the open access from the East Coast. So they were able to easily access the Kaesang Industrial Complex from the East Coast and also for the Kungangsan Tourism Zone as well. Uh, at that time, economic cooperation was very brisk, so it was also very easy to access. And at that time, uh, this kind of program or project were based only on declaration, so that is how it was made possible. So I believe that for the GPZ as well, then we need to have good agreement and cooperation with the UN command as well. And last is about uh, having to win the international society's agreement. So both South and North Koreans are parties to the Paris Climate Agreement. So we can also emphasize the need for international cooperation for climate response. So I would say that uh, the, some of the SDGs can also be further advanced by the cooperation on the Korean Peninsula DMZ. So perhaps this is one point that we can emphasize to the international community as well. Now then what would be some of the future challenges? Now, we need to further think about the projects or areas where we can cooperate. So for example, if we are to look at the three axes that I mentioned earlier, first is the environmental axis. So for the environmental axis, then we can have joint responses against the infectious diseases and disease prevention as well as natural disaster prevention. So for example, including COVID-19, there could be malaria, Africa swine disease, fever, and foot and mouth disease or avian flu. So these are some of the types of diseases that we can fight together. And we can also share information and data about droughts or typhoons or floods. And then on the ecology side, we can have joint prevention of forest insects and 
pests. So for example, the pine gall midge or a pine wilt disease. So the two Koreas already have the experience of combating these uh, forest pests together. And there are also some tree nurseries on the Kepung region as well as the Kumgangsan region. So we already have had the cooperation in the tree nursery as well. So maybe they can also uh, provide a starting point for us. And then also down the road, we can try to create a new modern industries, for example, natural circulatory livestock industry and so forth. And last is on the tourism aspect. So perhaps we can have joint survey on the DMC between the two Koreas in order to promote the biodiversity and preserve the forestry. And we can also work together to have the DMC uh, designated as a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. And the Kumgangsan mountain area was already designated as a Biosphere Reserve, so we already have that experience. And then also the Kumgangsan Biosphere region. So you see that from the Yeoncheon Imjingang River, and then all the way to Kumgangsan. So you see that it has already been designated as a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, so perhaps if we can work, so working toward having a border Biosphere Reserve designation could also be one challenge that we can work together. And last is about the governance of this region. So Germany has had the 1972 framework agreement between the two Germanys where they had the border committee and maybe we can also take reference from this. And now this is an example of Peru and Ecuador where they had had conflicts. And now from the Peruvian side, they had the Biosphere Reserve designated first. And then now this was expanded to the Ecuador Bosque Seco region as a border region as well. So perhaps this is can be one reference point for the Korean DMZ as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that, that was Dr. Hae Jung Lee, and thank you very much for being very punctual as well. So yes, about the green detente and also the green and peace zone. So she explained about the definition as well. And she also gave us a history of the North Korea policy of Korea. So saying how it is a relay. So the past governments have passed the baton to the next in this relay. And then also about the DMZ peace zone, she observed how there are already agreements between the two Koreas. And also for the environment, ecology, and tourism pillars, we can have cooperation. And especially it is important to start from the areas of interest of North Korea. So she also shed light on this strategic approach as well. So once again, thank you very much. The second um, presentation will be made by uh, Dr. Pro Frobel uh, from Germany, uh, from the German Federation for uh, the Environment and Nature Conservation. Uh, he will, he's uh, currently serving as the Secretary General of the Bund, and he will share with us an example of a German experience. So, oh, thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm a representative of BUND Friends of the Earth Germany, and I'm the German Green Belt initiator. And BUND Friends of the Earth Germany is with its 650,000 members, the leading union for protection of environment and nature in Germany. So, here you see the former inner German border. It was a horrific dividing line, killing many hundreds of people, tearing families and regions apart. 
but these inhuman areas also had another side. Here you can see an East German uh, border guard standing waist deep in grass and bushes. For almost 40 years, the area of the border fortification was generally not used for agriculture or forestry. Nature had a unique retreat there. So, UND started with bird surveys from the west in the East German border area in the mid-1970s and 1980s. So we had been prepared for many years when in November 1989 the border to our joy finally fell. In December 1989, only a few weeks after the fall of the Berlin Wall, UND developed at a conference the name and the vision for the Green Belt to preserve the natural values that had evolved under, let's say, the protection of that inhuman border. The Green Belt is the longest biotope in Germany. The core area covers 177 square kilometers, but with direct surrounding protected areas, the area increases almost 13 times. It runs from southern Germany, North Bavaria, to the North German lowlands and ends after 1,400 kilometers at the Baltic Sea. It's the only real existing cross-national biotope network system in Germany. Now a short impression of how the Greenbelt looks today in the landscape. Here's a wilderness area in the Trumling between Lower Saxonia and Saxony Anhalt. There live black storks and otters and beavers. It is the core zone of a new established cross-border biosphere reserve. It is only 10 kilometers away from the Volkswagen VW production facilities in Wolfsburg. Here you can see the green belt winds through an intensive agricultural landscape between the federal states Thuringia and Hess. It's an ideal condition for the, of the green belt, a mixture of bushes, trees, also old grass, fallow, and open areas. A semi-open, park-like landscape providing habitats for both open land and forest species. Based on mapping of the entire green belt, we know that 1,200 red list species live there and 146 different biotope types, from wet meadows to grassland to lakes and old forests. And where it is necessary, and especially where the open landscape character is to be preserved, we work very well with local farmers who keep the areas open with carefully mowing or grazing by sheep and cattle according to nature conservation guidelines. You see a rare wind jet, loud singing on a um, former border post of the GDR. A symbolic picture, nature knows no boundaries. And there are numerous terms and images and descriptions, narratives, <laughs> Um, like national symbol of peace and nature or ecological treasure that are nearly identical for Greenbelt and DMZ. The Greenbelt is the best known nature conservation project in Germany and the largest. Today, the Greenbelt is a national symbol and an international lighthouse project for nature conservation and has been supported for decades by almost all parts of politics. Some green belt facts, and I especially want to emphasize only a few. There are nine, nine federal states involved, 130 municipalities, 
It's a prime example of cooperation between the state and environmental organizations. At the moment, in addition to the local nature conservation authorities, in total, whole over Germany, 50 employees at GEOs and NGOs work for the Green Belt. And the total investments for nature conservation in the Green Belt since 2000 by GEOs and NGOs is approximately about 100 million euro. The key breakthrough in Green Belt's protected status was a national natural monument. In 2010, this protected area category, which has existed, for example, in the United States for a very, very long time, was newly included in the German nature conservation law. It is the only protected area category that combines natural and cultural aspects. From 2018, three federal states passed the law in the state parliament to declare their entire green belt legally valid as national nature monument. So, for example, in Thuringia, over 700 kilometers, Saxony-Anhalt, over 330 kilometers, in Brandenburg, depending on the federal state's share of the green belt. Now, at the moment, over 1,100 kilometers of the green belt, or 82% are now protected as national nature monument. The other federal states will follow. But since there are already many nature reserves in the remaining countries without a national monument at the moment, they are already about 99% of the green belt protected today. A protection status on the entire green belt was the aim of the UND in 1989. It took 30 years. The Green Belt has, beside the value for nature conservation, a second important function. You see some slides here, the situation just before 1989 and the situation on the same place today. It is an ecological monument documenting German reunification. It's a living memorial to German history. It's a memorial landscape. It shows today as a peaceful track in the landscape the dimension of the former horrible inner German border for the humans and I think for future generations there's no better way to remember. UND is furthermore a driving force for the European Green Belt along the former Iron Curtain. It's, I think, the world's greatest nature conservation project. It runs from the Barents Sea along the Baltic coast through Central Europe and the Balkans to the Black Sea, more than 12,500 kilometers. It's a vision of European cooperation and it connects 24 countries. A, seeming, a seemingly difficult task, but already in the last decades, 40 national parks were created along the former Iron Curtain, and there are already 3,200 protected areas along the line. And our long-term goal, which we strive together with 150 other GEOs and NGOs all over Europe, is the designation of this line as a UNESCO World Natural and Cultural Heritage, a so-called mixed site. And at the moment in Germany, this week, in just a few days, the environment ministers of the German federal states will meet again and decide whether they support the nomination. The final decision will be made by the Conference of Ministers of Culture in spring 2023. 
And this will be an important decision because since the list of proposals for UNESCO is only set up every 10 years. It's a serial process, meaning one country like Germany can start and the others follow. Here you can see the existing mixed nature and culture World Heritage Sites worldwide. There are not too many, about 40. And the European Green Belt would be visible on a world, world map. And maybe, that would be my hope, at some point in the future, the DMC could also be one of the World Heritage Sites. Finally, I would ask you to let me give five recommendations based on three, four decades of work for the German Green Belt, which is so similar to the DMZ in many ways. First, in case of growing rapprochement and reunion of Korea, which I wish you really from the bottom of my heart, nature conservation should be the first priority in the DMC. For example, as a national park or a national nature monument, let nature have its way in the four kilometer wide core area as a wilderness zone. Secondly, when old traffic infrastructure is rebuilt in the case of reunion, roads and railway lines, for example, crossing the DMC should be carefully planned whenever possible as tunnels or with green bridges without destroying DMC's futures. Green bridges are often used in Europe in the last two decades and function very well. And the, in this context, please be very careful with infrastructure projects in the CC set and with the decreasing area of the CC set because the CC set is also very, very valuable for nature conservation. In case of reunion, preserve as much of the border fortifications as possible. One of the main problems in Germany is that the former border is hardly visible anymore. Unfortunately, almost all fences, watchtowers were destroyed immediately after the opening of the border. Don't make the same mistake. If the DMC is meant to become a memorial landscape for future generations, these structures, after demining, need to stay visible. And link the DMC and especially the CC set to ecological sustainable tourism, offer peaceful experiences for recreation in nature, for example, hiking and cycling. Last point, strengthen CC set as a model region for sustainable development. Very important are cooperations with local people and NGOs, support of local farmers for organic farming, and sustainable habitat management for rare species. And therefore, establish new state funding programs, so-called ecosystem service payments, for this purpose. Such funding programs exist in Germany for over 40 years. And please designate additional biosphere reserves within the CCC. A concluding remark. An intensive scientific and political exchange has developed during the last 20 years between Germany and South Korea, between Greenbelt and DMC. Therefore, I would like to thank the Ministry of Unification for making exchange possible once more today. Despite a distance of over 8,500 8, kilometers between our countries, a lot of common work unites us.
Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Frebel. So he is the General Secretary of BUND, Friends of the Earth, Germany. And thanks to the efforts so far, and together with the other stakeholders, for example, the local residents, uh, they were able to designate the Green Belt and also effectively preserve and protect the Green Belt so far. And he has also given some recommendations to Korea as well. Thank you. Uh, Next speaker will join us online, Professor Zhu Feng uh, from the Nanjing University. Are you ready, Professor? Yes. Please go ahead, Professor Zhu, Zhu Feng. Uh, 15 minutes. Thanks for inviting me for such a, a brilliant you know, uh, forum. I see um, a lot of uh, very interesting presentation from the uh, uh, two uh, panelists. From the Chinese perspective, of course, uh, the fall of the DMZ and turning it into the GDZ, to be honest, is a really uh, what a way uh, have been longing for the, for for many years because. I think the DMZ is a metaphor of the uh, prolonged Cold War uh, uh, state between the two Koreans. If the DMZ could finally just uh, dismiss and also turning it into the uh, GDZ, I really believe that means the two Koreans will get into the uh, full, you know, embracement to each other and the reunification of the two Koreans will be not far. Of course, to the regional security, I think the uh, dismiss of the DMZ is a big symbol of a regional uh, peace and security building that. So that's why um, I think the Chinese really help the DMZ kids just uh, turning into the uh, GDZ. It's not just uh, well be a very positive you know, the advancement for the regional security and peace, but uh, it also will be uh, very fundamentally helpful to the China to maintain you know, peripheral uh, security and, uh, and stability. But the problem is how the, 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 we say DMZ could just uh, become the GDZ. It's not uh, just uh, some sort of uh, very profoundly uh, theoretical question, but it's also a uh, uh, very, very compelling you know, diplomatic and uh, political issues for two Koreans. Then we will see um, next year will be uh, soon be the uh, 70 uh, anniversary of the conclusion of the uh, DMZ. So for such a so long, then we, we say, why the DMZ is still there? Um, the, I think a couple of reasons is easy uh, figuring out. First, it, as I mentioned, two Korean uh, couldn't just uh, finally just to move on to some sort of a full appeasement and embracement. Then some kind of the, uh, Cold War uh, state uh, remain just uh, haunting the uh, Korean Peninsula. Of course, second, then we will see uh, some sort of uh, very disputable, you know, uh, policy orientation, uh, wishfully and practically both, just uh, still just a uh, haunting the uh, Korean Peninsula. For example, from Chinese points of view, we just believe, you know, we should just show the two faces to the North Korea. One is tough, other is soft. Tough means we should be totally made clear. No nuclear North Korea will be admitted and also will be just perceived, perceived as legal and, and realistic. But on the other hand, we also just the how say uh, help the international community could just the how say being a little bit gentle and nice to the uh, North Korea because we also see the COVID pandemic is hitting the country very hard. Then its economy now is slipping down. Then a lot of uh, uh, people suffering now is also getting getting worse. But the problem is why the DPRK as the most, we say, a despotic 
and the most, you know, the authoritarian regime could have survived so long. The reason is very, very simple, because the uh, regime and even the governments uh, um, in the mechanism has never been just the how say worse than the DPRK. It's a uh, political control from top to down is always tightening up more than seven decades. So now I think the common challenge for Chinese, Koreans, and the international community is how to crack down most, we say, uh, fundamental, we say, net share in this world. That will be some sort of a key to get the uh, DMZ turning into the GDZ eventually. And since the end of a uh, uh, Cold War, when we see the DPRK, it was really cornered because this year also marked the 30 years anniversary of a normalization between Beijing and Seoul. Then very quickly after the uh, demise of the Soviet Union, Moscow also just uh, uh, was uh, tossed out the uh, Pyongyang. So it being just the, 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 the DPRK has been very struggling on how it could survive. How there, you know, some sort of a, such a very we say a uh, disastrous and desperate regime could just uh, persist. Mm -hmm. Then we will see things really just uh, how say remain in, intact. For example, Pyongyang's desperate regime remains some sort of strong. Then on the other hand, whether there's some sort of economic slide on, but the problem is that there are nuclear capability is also just like getting strong. Then another view is that particularly ways there's some sort of a change the international surroundings. There's no country in the world which now is more happier or more, you know, some excited than the DPRK because I consider it if the great power competition and the rivalry well just uh, has a hitting back then it will be most reliable way for DPRK to survive. So then we'll see in the past two years, the DPRK repeatedly show they are some sort of an unbreakable, you know, the unlaunched relationship with Beijing. They also just extend their warm hand to the Moscow. They also would like to propose to send the volunteer military to the, uh, uh, we say such a uh, current, you know, war between the uh, Moscow and the Kiev. So then we also should know some sort of a very specialty is still just a, how say, so we say uh, promising to the DPR case, some sort of their own dream. They want to survive. They want to keep up their regime system. They want just the, how say, um, extend some sort of a Kim families, you know, the full power control over the DPRK. So the problem is how we can crack down the DPRK. I think it's a real, real test for how the peace and the stability could be just the winning back. And in other words, we say how the DMZ could turning into the GDZ. So my personal view is that the likelihood for the time being is also now is running high. A couple of the, uh, things we could just easily just uh, pick that up to see how we can just uh, proactively and creatively just addressing the DP DMZ issue. First is, I really hope the source policy of the D, uh, DPRK could just uh, keep your uh, persistency and accuracy. Then we will see in the past three decades, where the government change and different you know, ruling party finally on the hold of the, the source policy of DPRK also become very swinging from the left to the right, from the engaging the DPRK to rivaling DPRK. That's the problem is 
if you use the China as uh, some sort of case, then we'll see what kind of a force finally rewrite the China's today's political map. Because from the Deng Xiaoping to Zhao Ziyang to Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintang, China's reform and open that policy just uh, showed a little time it will change with a different regime, with a different government. So I really hope now the new government could reconsider it's a very hostile policy vis-a-vis -vis the DPRK. On the other hand, I think a so also should have shown you have some sort of enthusiasm to engage the DPRK. That's why, uh, from my perspective, I think the three decades of our case policy of the DPRK usury is very great and a very, very promising. But the problem is I see no consistency and some sort of easy swing and the easy, you know, just turning to the different sides. So how the soul could continue to hold on to your conviction engaging the DPRK required some sort of unbrokable, unshiftable and consistent efforts. If they can just move that way, I will see the DPRK will be sooner or later cracked, no matter how it is, just a national or some sort of a very, very big iron ball. The second is, I think at the regional level, we also need to rebuild some sort of a consensus. For example, back to 20 years ago, I think the US and China worked together to launch the six party talks. Then we will see it's also a very promising timeline to engage the DPRK. So then now the question is how Beijing and Washington could rebuild the consensus to work together addressing the DPRK issue in a collective and a cooperative manner. It's also a test for the great power relations. But basically I see US-China should be highly aware just to ease down the, some sort of escalating of attention of the DPRK is really, really serving the both powers at the best. So then for the moment, I really hope Beijing and Washington could rejoin the head to work together again, addressing the DPRK issues. It's not just a with some sort of highball, you know, the, the, the sanction. We also need to push softly some time. So that kind of uh, uh, well-organized methodology probably also will be indispensable for us to crack the national of the DPRK. Last one, I think, in some sort of uh, international collaboration, is also much highly and accurately uh, required. I mean, for example, most of the country, including the Japan, don't just uh, be in harsh to the DPRK. Harsh is the one here, one side, but we also show another side. It's a gentle and even smiling. Keep engaging the DPRK. To be honest, eventually at the end is the way we can crack the DPR case next year. So finally, let me come to my conclusion. China offered a very shining example how a very closely, you know, immune from the outside world's such an isolated power, finally just become some sort of a leading force to engage the world in the past more than four decades. What kind of a force to change the China? What kind of a force to crack down the China's national share? Keep persistence. Accumulate international collaboration and then move on to a shared target. That's all some sort of a very useful and a valuable resource. We can easily just, how say, identify from the 
more than four decades of China's historical transition. So from moment, if we really want to end the uh, Cold War state, and we could also just the house say, uh, build the sense of the DMZ genuinely into a GDZ, I think we need the three levels of joined and the collaborative endorsement. So Seoul should just uh, have say, still showing you an uh, enthusiasm to engage the DPRK. Whatever the government and the ruling party will come to the power. The second, we needed to reshape the power consent. We should just embrace the DPRK, engage the DPRK together, rather than just keep them very harshly kicked off, kick, kicked and punched. Last one, international community. We also need to show in some sort of our, you know, shared vision. If we can join the hand together, sooner or later, we can just help, help what? Help change the DPRK gradually. So that's why my view is that DMZ's demands is really a historical moment. Will be unbelievably welcome throughout the region and the world. But the problem is how we can rebuild the international collaboration and endorsement. But most, of, I think, the compelling challenge for the moment is how the could get back to you are, you know, some sort of uh, very valuable policy of engaging and appeasing the DPRK. It's very, very required. On the other hand, if we always take the DPRK as a bad guy, as a, some sort of totally enemy, how such an engagement policy could work? In other ways, if the DPRK always is scared off, just the hiding at the corner, pretending to be very proactive, just showing how stubborn and how you know determined they can just uh, how they bounce back is there any timeline we can just uh, how they figure out to to what to change the dprk now so for this moment yeah. I really heard the fall of the berlin wall is also another very telling example how to create could just get into some sort of historical movement of the, you know, embracement. But the problem is, DPRK is never former East Germany. So that's why, to be honest, I don't think the fall of the Berlin Wall will be an interesting metaphor we can easily imply in the future of the DMZ's demise. So the most important thing is we need to engage the DPRK again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Zhu Fang. Professor Zhu Fang um, pointed out the fact that the DMZ was the outcome uh, of the Cold War era, and from the perspective of an international political scientist, he has made some suggestions regarding the North Korean policy of Korean government uh, based on uh, a sense of friendship. Last but not least, uh, let me invite Dr. Jung Ho Nam from the Korea Maritime Institute. Thank you for your introduction. I am Jung Ho Nam from the Korea Maritime Institute. Uh, you've had lunch and it's the afternoon time and I am sure that you are quite sleepy. Uh, Professor Che is struggling with time management, I can tell. And uh, if other speakers take up a lot of time, my time gets reduced. So I would like to uh, make sure that the total 
uh, time limit is uh, kept. If you look back on the inter-Korean relations, I've been studying this topic for many years, and I feel always frustrated. Why? Because from the perspective of a research or academic, of a political science, uh, the reality should be changed uh, for us to be able to move on to the next topic. However, nothing really has changed over the years. The broader framework has not changed. So we, among researchers and scholars, uh, say the same thing, thing that uh, we have to keep repeating the cliché. So Everything that we get to say sounds like a cliché. Last week, uh, together with the Ministry of Unification and also with people uh, from international uh, organizations in Korea, uh, I had an opportunity to uh, do a conference on this topic, a similar topic. And everything that I heard uh, sounded like a cliché, and it uh, feels as if that we are repeating the same rhetoric over and over again. But that doesn't mean that we should not do it at all. So my presentation, again, is based on the books that I wrote and the research papers that I've written. So I am sure that some of you will find much of the points that I will make quite familiar. Still, uh, these points are important. So uh, let me begin my presentation on that note. The DMZ. A lot of people think of it as a piece of land. And what about the Han River? A part of the Han River is not a part of the DMZ. The border area between the two Koreas include both the land and uh, ocean areas uh, consisting of four regions uh, with uh, unique characteristics. Uh, there's the northern limit line uh, between the East Sea and the West Sea. In the West Sea, the line is marked uh, by confrontation and conflict. But on the in the East Sea, there hasn't been much confrontation. But uh, regarding the land, there's this estuary of the Han River. And if you go towards the north, you find the DMZ. So the border areas uh, can be divided into these four regions, and my presentation will focus on the estuary of the Han River. Because this is a border area, this is a piece of land where you cannot really uh, place your own claims on the territorial rights. And one of the opinions that was suggested last week was as follows. That way, as we try to pursue inter-Korea relations uh, and betterment of it, uh, maybe the most promising border area is the Han River estuary because there's no clear demarcation line. So drawing a line in the middle of the Han River estuary uh, is not correct. So I will address these three topics uh, to three and four minutes I would like to spend on each of these bullet points. First, regarding the political paradox in terms of ecological integrity, physical access has not been possible, so ecologically there has been a lot of advancement. The central government has been trying to pursue certain initiatives in this part of the region. And lastly, I will talk about the current circumstances and future suggestions. So this is the area that I am talking about. So this is a part of the piece that I am talking about, the Han River estuary. As a matter of fact, uh, this is a virtual line. There is no clear demarcation line here. And this line is from 1953. Uh, North Korea, Ch China, and the U.S. has drawn the line. But this area, uh, because it had some issues regarding the demarcation, there has been some conflict. Uh, there has been the Blue Crab War between the U.K. and France, and likewise, 
Uh, we had some disputes uh, uh, about this line. However, we've been having some uh, inter-Korean summit meetings and even uh, a summit meeting between the DPRK and the U.S. Uh, took place. So across this Korean peninsula, this is exactly the area where the military tension is running at the highest level. And if you look this part, this is a neutral area. Uh, starting from Marto, an island, and all the way to Sun Outlook. And a lot of people, when they think of the Han River estuary, they think of fresh water, but 80% of the water here is salt water. As such, this Han River estuary region uh, has a lot of cultural and historical uh, heritage, and it does uh, have a value as a land and as a piece of ocean. So there's no middle line, as I mentioned before, and this means that there's no conflict between the two Koreas, which means that there hasn't been much discussion between the two Koreas either. Again, this area, as you can see here, uh, has become a great ecological treasure trove. And this area is a home to about 70 protected areas. So this is uh, indeed a biological hotspot. And we also need to talk about the environmental aspects of the region, which are quite important. About 64% of the uh, natural, uh, the, the nature and the species to, uh, designated uh, by the Korean government to live in this region, 64% of them, uh, which is very rare by any standards. As was mentioned by the scholar from Germany, uh, during the Aryan Curtain era, uh, Germany has moved on to the Green Belt era, and we could uh, see the same thing happening in Korea. Uh, what about social economic aspects? As you can see here, the activities are going up. And in the case of the use of land, uh, there are forests, rice fields, and fields. And also, in terms of fisheries, uh, this part of the region is home to 17 fish harbors. And there are 600 fishing boats. And there's a little bit of tourism industry here in this region. And currently, there have been some initiatives on the Han River estuary, including both legally and non-legally binding plans at national and local levels. And there have been some marine protected areas designated by the Korean government. And there have been some echo trails. And there have been some researches conducted as well regarding this region. So. Uh, you must have heard a lot about these initiatives, both at the central government level and local government levels. So in Chan, Gyeonggi province, and various government ministries have come up with various initiatives uh, to protect and develop this region. So I talked about the current circumstances that this region, region is very politi politically um, sensitive area and uh, it is vulnerable to political fluctuations. And because of the restricted physical access to this area, uh, this region is a biological hotspot. Uh, it is home to various uh, flora and fauna species uh, that need conservation. And this estuary is not uh, easy for any vessels to transit through. So this region needs to be developed. However, uh, there are a lot of sensitivity, sensitivities around the region at the moment. So it's not easy to, de to develop this region. Then, then at this current time point, what will be our suggestions? As you can tell from these photos, we have with us uh, two gentlemen who have been involved in the initiative of regarding initiative regarding the peaceful use of the region. And let me share with you this analysis. Uh, if you uh, compare the Han River and DMZ in terms of the searches, the DMZ is comes up a lot more frequently. But if you compare North Korea and DMZ, 
and North Korea comes up uh, quite more often in terms of the Google searches. And as you can understand, the inter-Korean relations are deteriorating uh, due to more than 10 missile launches uh, by North Korea this year. And because of this confrontation, um, many of the agreements uh, reached between the two Koreas could uh, backslide. Still, the Yun administration uh, is pursuing the so-called green detente policy. It has been adopted as one of the national priority tasks. And uh, two sites were registered as a Ramsar wetlands. And last year, the a report was submitted to a UN environmental organization. And at the same time, um, the report regarding the migratory birds were also submitted. So I believe that there's room for cooperation between the two Koreas when it comes to the environmental matters. So this is a neutral area. South Korean vessels cannot enter uh, beyond this line. Then right all the way until right before the limit, uh, we could conduct researches. Uh, this is something that we can do even without an agreement with uh, North Korea. And the results of the research uh, should be published so that we can utilize and know how once there's an agreement between the two Koreas to develop the region. And at the same time, uh, we are members of these uh, international organizations, and there could be many things that we can do together uh, with international organizations. And at the same time, at least within South Korea, we should be able to establish principles regarding uh, the development of the region, uh, because uh, there's many, there are many divergent, view, divergent views even inside South Korea. So we need to be able to come up with a coherent set of principles for the development of the region. And to talk about suggestions, after we break the stalemate uh, with North Korea, we should be able to work together between the two Koreas towards the SDGs of the United Nations. And at the same time, a joint surveys are also possible between the two Koreas. So we once did it in uh, the year 2008 uh, based on the inter-Korean agreement. And thirdly, uh, we could establish and operate a joint task force for a comprehensive management plan development. And fourthly, we could identify priority actions on green issues uh, involving migratory birds and so forth. So when it comes to the green data and take policy, we should be able to set some priorities in our endeavors. And what if uh, we are able to ease some sanctions against North Korea. Uh, I am taking an example of the Northern Ireland and the and England. And as you can tell here, regarding the border waterways, there has been an agreement between these two regions uh, to jointly manage the areas. And whether it's the DMZ or the a body of water uh, between the two Koreas, maybe uh, this is a model that we can utilize. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Nam, and also for keeping to the time limit. The Han River estuary, uh, in some sense, is the most ideal region for green detente, uh, a point that I think I can agree on because there's no clear boundary between the two Koreas. And also, it is a treasure trove of ecological systems and a region that where there's no market confrontation between the two Koreas. And compared to the DMZ, uh, Han River Estuary is much more well known to the Korean public and also to uh, people in the international community. And um, there are definitely something that we can do right away. For instance, taking measurements, building data based on such uh, data uh, on measurements and working together with organizations, international organizations, or uh, taking joint surveys or studies uh, together with North Korea. Uh, I 
agree on all of the points that you made. Now, let us move on to the discussion session, uh, starting with uh, Professor Jin Che from the China University of Political Science and Law, who will join us online. You have six minutes, uh, Professor Kim. Thank you very much, moderator. Yes, I am Jin Cho from the Zhonghua University, and I would like to first thank the Ministry of Unification for the invitation, and especially Director General Kim Jang Ro, as well as the staff members who enabled today's event. And I would like to ask for your understanding. Uh, for my online participation instead of uh, direct participation. Now, listening to the presentation so far, uh, it has personally been a learning time for me as well. I would just like to present my discussion in largely three topics. Now, as the moderator has given me six minutes, I would then try to skip the summary of the presentation and regarding what the speaker has mentioned and also what the speaker has explained. Let me go straight to that. Yes, if you may, please go ahead. Right, so what uh, Dr. Lee has emphasized. So that was about the infectious disease control. And then also since the UN Environment Development Conference, so what has been the uh, climate change efforts in North Korea so far? And then what are what can be the tasks for the Korean Peninsula? So first about the infection control. Now, if I may cite the labor paper of North Korea, then, then there was the Supreme People's Congress, the committee meeting, and they talked about how they would strengthen control of infectious diseases by legislating emergency infectious control act. And it also talks about how the people have to have an ongoing sense of infection control and a sense of crisis. So it talks about how the people must maintain this sense of crisis and this awareness of infection control for the nation to be successful in fighting off infections. But still, one month later, on November 17th of the Labour newspaper, then it talks about the need to continue with this emergency sense of infection control, meaning that the infectious disease issue in North Korea is still quite serious. And then about climate change, now as it shows here, Now, this is what North Korea has submitted. So part of the report that they have submitted in 2012. So there was the $20.9 billion in GDP in 1992 in DPRK, but then now in 1996, it has plummeted to $10.6 billion. And then even more recently in 2008, it was not able to go back to the previous level. And one of the reasons for this is the consecutive natural disasters. And then the Labor newspaper on November 16th, 2022, 
Then it also talks about how the government is considering responses to extreme weather conditions. So I believe I have about three minutes left. So let me skip some of the next topics. And then moving on to the wetland protection. And yes, the uh, Ramsar Convention was also mentioned. And so as this was mentioned earlier, I would skip this. And what I would like to emphasize is that North Korea has been actively engaging in environmental protection conventions. So this makes it possible for international cooperation in environmental protection in North Korea. So for example, in the Rio summit, So since then, there were the Climate Change Convention, Biodiversity Convention, then also the Wetlands Convention, and the Desertification Prevention Convention, so some of the conventions dating back to the 1970s. So and also about the, so North Korea has joined many of these conventions. So. For example, the Biodiversity Convention. So I have listed some of the agreements as part of that. So for example, renewable energy development and so forth. And when you look at the supporting organizations, then the UNEP and UNDP, UNESCO, UNDP, FAO, and UNDP as well. So you also see the supporting organizations for these projects under the Biodiversity Convention. So when we look at the current status of North Korea with regards to this environment protection, then it seems as if there are quite a lot of needs in North Korea as well. And then now regarding the green and peace zone, then what we need to do, both inside and outside of the Korean Peninsula, let me just list uh, three tasks that we need to do. First is to convince North Korea in order to encourage the response. So for us to try to do something like this, then there has to be a counterpart. So no matter how good something is that we want to try if the other side does not respond to it then it is all for naught so if we are to recognize north korea as the cooperation partner then like it or not then for the north korean regime to whom survival is the most important then we would have to try to convince them somehow so i believe that we need to meet them in order to have cooperation. Now, I myself had made presentations at the Kim Il-sung University. I have also taken part in the Tumen River Forum in China several times, meeting with the scholars of North Korea and discussing with them. And what I feel in my encounters with the North Korean scholars is that now, they tend to overreact to criticisms of North Korea or situation in North Korea, but then they highly welcome explanation about the trends in the outside world. And the second task is for the Korean government to come up with a long-term plan and try to win a nationwide support and also have trans-party cooperation. So the former minister, Yu, in the morning also mentioned that it is important to have the engagement by the people and the parties as well. And of course, uh, there are the military provocations like the ICBM missiles 
So, but then of course uh, these are tricky issues, so I'm not going to go into that. And the South Korean Constitution talks about how everyone is equal before the law. And now, for Korean Constitution, when it says people, then it includes not only the people of South Korea, but also for North Korea as well. So I believe that based on this uh, constitutional definition, uh, we could try to win by partisan support. And last, for the Unification Ministry and the Foreign Ministry, so they need to very closely cooperate, but not only inside the Korean government, but also with the international organizations. So there are many uh, Korean nationals working in the international organizations as well. So the ministries of unification, foreign, uh, foreign affairs, as well as other relevant organizations. So it is important to have close cooperation among them and also to actively utilize international organizations wherever possible. And as was so as was mentioned by a US a scholar, peace does not mean absence of conflicts. It is the ability to peacefully address the conflicts. Now, South Korea is a country that achieved miracle on the Han River, in other words, economic success, and now it is experiencing cultural success in the form of K-culture. And Korea has the potential to lead the way in this ecological cooperation as well. And as a Chinese scholar, I wish Korea every success in this endeavor. Thank you very much. So as a North Korea expert, he explained about the current situation in North Korea. And he also pointed out that North Korea is a member to many international environmental conventions and agreements. So perhaps based on that, we could have international cooperation or even inter-Korea cooperation for DMZ. But now in order to make this possible, then we need to first convince North Korea and also convince uh, Korean people as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sui Shin. Now let me invite uh, Mr. Kang Woo Lee from the National Human Resources Development Institute to six minutes again. Uh, great to see you. My name is Kang Woo Lee. Uh, Professor Zhu Peng uh, was the one that I was asked to address in my comments. So regarding his uh, presentation, I would like to uh, give my personal interpretation uh, before uh, making some other comments. Uh, Professor Zhu Peng talked about how to build peace on the Korean Peninsula. He called for consistent engagement policy and a gentle approach and cooperation with China. And through all those endeavors, the DMZ it could be converted into a green peace zone, uh, and it could be a soft approach that could be taken uh, by relevant parties. I agree on the view that was uh, put, for, put forth. But regarding the development of the DMZ into green peace zone, uh, what does it mean for peace on the Korean Peninsula? I would like to add my personal view on that as well. First of all, uh, turning the DMZ into a green peace zone uh, will facilitate the establishment of peace on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, that is the reason that we need to put a priority on this initiative and pursue it consistently. North Korea uh, thus far has uh, been aware of the initiatives uh, for the peaceful use of the DMZ. And North Korea said that it will be only after the signing of a peace treaty between the two Koreas uh, that they will be more willing to to pursue it together with us. However, if 
as we try to turn the DMZ into a green peace zone, naturally we will be able to reduce the war of risk and promote stability on the Korean Peninsula. As such, naturally, this will have an effect of promoting peace on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, in terms of the sequence of things to take place, then if we are to uh, sign a peace of treaty first before working together on the initiatives like this, but contrarily by uh, working together first on these types of initiatives, such as the Green Peace Zone, uh, we would be better positioned to sign a peace treaty uh, because our work uh, will promote peace. So that is one thing that I wanted to share with you. And as we try to pursue this initiative of Green Peace Zone, um, as we try to work towards ultimate reunification, the parties to the armistice agreement and also other neighboring countries uh, should be able to support our initiative. And the development of a Green Peace Zone uh, is a project that would require the endorsement of our neighbors. And as we pursue this, uh, based on their support and environment endorsement, I think we would be able to build a foundation uh, for future cooperation and gain an experience of working together uh, between us and our neighbors. So that is another meaning that I would like to attach to this initiative that was proposed. And one more thing that I can add is as follows. Uh, the DMZ could be developed into a venue for inter-Korean uh, partnership and cooperation, and that will facilitate the building of mutual trust between the two Koreas. Over the years, uh, there have been many projects that were pursued together by the two Koreas, but due to unilateral uh, breaking of the commitment, uh, many of the initiatives uh, came to a stop. Uh, they could not continue. But uh, this particular initiative for building a green peace zone, if we can pursue it consistently without ever stopping it, I think it would uh, make great contribution uh, to promoting peace on the Korean Peninsula. And North Korea continues to engage in uh, military provocations. However, if we are going to promote this initiative of Green Peace Zone uh, and use it to send out uh, messages of peace and reconciliation towards the DPRK, I believe that uh, it could uh, go a long way towards um, appeasing North Korea and making it uh, more cooperative towards us. Last but not least, because time's running out, there hasn't been much progress uh, so far in many of the initiatives uh, that we wanted to promote involving North Korea. Then if we are going to be different this time, what exactly is it that we need? There was an initiative uh, to build a global peace park in the DMZ in the 1980s. Uh, and I myself was involved in that project. And looking back on my experiences, there were things that I think uh, we could have done better. First, in terms of international cooperation, uh, we need international partnership. Uh, we need to develop a ma master plan for this uh, Green Peace Zone project uh, so that we can uh, sub ensure support of the international community, especially the US, Russia, and China uh, should uh, be able to buy in our uh, proposal. And this is something that we can also explain towards the United Nations as well. Uh, when I was involved in this International Peace Park project, uh, we uh, try to persuade China, Russia, and the U.S. Uh, and we also did our pitch uh, before the United Nations. But however, uh, we could not really uh, secure a buy-in from the U.S. And also, we could not uh, secure the full support of the United Nations command, uh, which weakened the momentum of the project. 
therefore, for this Greenpeace Zone project, uh, I hope that we'll be able to develop a master plan uh, as quickly as possible so that we can do a better job at persuading the U.S. and the U.N. command. Again, um, regarding the securing of the support of the United Nations Command, I believe that that is as important as securing support of the North Koreans. Because uh, when they perceive the DMZ from the perspective of the, of the UNC, uh, they primarily think of it as a military zone. So they could be rather negative towards the, these types of initiatives uh, involving the development of the DMZ. Therefore, we need active uh, efforts uh, to talk to the UNC and encourage them to see the potential peaceful use of the DMZ. The, U the United Nations commands a jurisdiction over the DMZ is something um, that I think we could uh, work around because I know that it's inevitable for the UNC to militarily have a jurisdiction over the DMZ. However, when it comes to the peaceful use uh, of the DMZ, maybe we can find a way uh, to allow us to have a little more control or the power or influence over the use of the DMZ. Thank you. Professor Lee, I know that you have many more comments to make about this important issue, which is also an area of your expertise. I could not give you more time because of the time constraints. You emphasized the importance of cooperation with neighboring countries and also securing cooperation from the international community. Our next discussant is uh, Dr. Chan Young Sun from the Kongo University. He's a North Korean expert. Six minutes. Hello, this is Chan Young Sun, as just introduced. And now, regarding the DMZ as GPZ and also division implications, so it is a great uh, pleasure for me to be serving as a discussant in this session. And so I listened with great interest to uh, Professor Kai Prevel's presentation. I believe that German experience and future have uh, important implications for Korea, especially for the DMZ as well. And one thing, so the biggest question for me was about the the motivation or the what enabled such agreement. So what drove this process, which was not easy by any means. So, and what was the cause of 650,000 memberships? So the need for peace or the value awareness of the environmental preservation or enthusiasm for historic preservation or the responsibility to pass this on to the next generation. So whatever it would be, I was wondering about the drivers that made this possible. And the second thing that stood out for me was the fact that the NGOs were the were playing the leading role. So of course the landscape and also the historic meaning of the DMZ. And so I personally believe that it should be the NGOs who should take leadership in this type of project. Now Green Belt is a historic and cultural heritage and now this type of combination does not occur naturally. In other words, we need to define the meaning of nature, we need to discover the cultural values, and we need to make conscious efforts to preserve and protect them, meaning that we have to go beyond political desires and we have to be flexible about various issues and we need to draw out agreements. Now, since 1975, so based on the data that has been collected since 1975 regarding the a DMZ and the natural preservation, uh, you, are, you have been uh, active in protecting and developing the Green Belt Germany since 1989. So I see that a lot long work has gone into this. And now, again, I see that the NGOs' leadership and role have been very important. And how do you define the roles between the government and the NGOs? Were they horizontal relations or cooperative relations? And the reason why I ask is, now on the Korean Peninsula, 
I was wondering whether the NGOs can be the leaders in DMZ management. Now, because strictly speaking, do we have NGOs in North Korea? That is one question. But anyways, an entity that is uh, flexible and also to uh, flexibly address these issues, then perhaps rather than the government, maybe it is the NGO or international NGOs who could be who would be more appropriate to take the leadership in this effort. So if you could also shed light on this question. And of course, uh, many important messages were given, but I do believe that the issues of the Korean Peninsula should be dealt with by the two Koreas. Now, next year marks the 70th anniversary of the armistice. Now, whenever we thought of the truce line or the DMZ, then what we always think of is barbed wire or the wired fence. But then now uh, there is a book by anthropologist Kang Juan, and the book is entitled There is No Wired Fence on the Truce Line. So there are, so I have also looked at some of the barbed wires between North and South Koreas. But yes, indeed, on the Truce Line, there are no barbed wires. But whenever we talk about the Truce Line, then we always think about the wired fence or the barbed wire. So people also believe that the DMZ has such barbed wire. So I would say that this is the prison of memory. And the meaning or the, the convention of thinking that we have been all beholden to for the past 70 years. So we have to break out of this. So we need to break out of this conventional thinking and try to think of programs or projects that would help us do so. So for the local authorities as well, they are also trying to create different programs or create tourism resources along the DMZ region. And perhaps that's where we can also have division of roles between the government and the private sector or the civilian sector. But there have been some good examples, successful examples. So for example, the Tobong district, they have turned the a tank base into a cultural space and turned it into a culture and peace camp. And so what is important is for us to set the right direction for the DMZ as well. So then such direction may be led by the local governments and so perhaps the local governments can play the mediating role and we also need to have engagement by artists and painters or philosophers so then there can be five directions for the dmz first it can be turned into a space of peace philosophy so we need to turn this into a peace uh, into a, a space a unified space for a peace philosophy. In other words, to think about what peace is and what it should be. And second, it also has to be a space for peace communication. So the life of a space is determined by the communication that takes place in the space. So I believe that in such a case, then we also need to make sure that DMZ can be turned into a space where communication and empathy can happen. And third, it should be moving toward unification and culture. So in this case, we also need to strengthen space storytelling. And fourth is to create linkage with the local regeneration. And in this case, we also have to move toward cultural economics. And for the DMZ as well, we can also borrow from public arts. So the DMZ GPZ vision can be starting from writing the abnormal name, which is the DMZ. So we need to create projects where we will be able to transform the perceptions on peace and also where we will be able to reflect on human rights through international peace art. That is all. Thank you very much. So now I thought you were a North Korea expert, but now you are a peace expert. Right, so BUND with 650,000 members. 
So what was the drivers that made such a strong membership possible? And what enabled the effort by the BUND to move to this green belt? And then also the role of the NGOs. And what are the roles or what are the relations between the NGOs and the government? And he also mentioned that we have to break out of the prison of memory. So thank you very much. Last but not least, we have with us Mr. Chung Ho Nam uh, from the Lee Jung Hoon uh, from the Gyeonggi Research Institute. Our Gyeonggi Research Institute is a public research institute of the Gyeonggi Province. We cover the northern Gyeonggi Province, the DMZ, and international relations uh, in those areas. I always closely follow of the developments in these regions. And as I study these topics regarding the Han River estuary and the border regions, I always get excited, but also at the same time rather disappointed and frustrated at the same time. I am supposed to comment on Dr. Nam's presentation and the comments that he made in the beginning of his presentation uh, represented my thoughts exactly. How uh, will we be able to bring ourselves, break ourselves away from the discussion of the same topics over and over again? Um, that is something that I think everyone would agree on. Uh, we've had DMZ forums four times until now. This is the fifth one that we're having this year, and we've made great endeavors on this front. But as was mentioned by many of the speakers, there hasn't been much progress thus far, especially when it comes to the Han River estuary. Uh, there, has, there are some differences uh, from the DMZ. Uh, based on numbers, in terms of the awareness of the DMZ and Han River estuary, I understand that DMZ is a widely and internationally recognized as a zone that needs to be turned into a peace zone. However, the Han River estuary is not really well known globally. However, personally, I believe that uh, we can find great value in the Han River estuary, uh, as important as the value that we can attach to the DMZ. I cannot uh, share all of the details. However, if you think of the uh, brand value of the DMZ and compare that to the brand values of uh, global companies such as Samsung, uh, to the extent that is beyond our expectation. Uh, we could tell that people attached a lot of brand value to the DMZ. Uh, its brand power was as strong as the one of Samsung. But what about Han River Estuary? Just about 38% of the respondents uh, were aware of the Han River Estuary, and especially the young people. Only about 20 to 30 percent of the people knew about the Han River Estuary. So, in terms of marketing, the efforts were not uh, successful. Uh, people, because people did not uh, know a lot about the fact that we needed to preserve or develop uh, the Han River Estuary. So, we need to raise people's awareness first of all of the Han River Estuary. Uh, Dr. Nam uh, talked about the researches so far and has made some suggestions as well. And I also would like to uh, add one or two comments myself. What are the things that we can do immediately, right away? Uh, and then at the same time, what are the things that we cannot do right away but must be done uh, sometime in the future? First, what are the things that we can do right away? The residents themselves. The people themselves uh, do not really know about the Han River estuary. They don't remember the existence of the Han River uh, estuary. And, and maybe because the division has been so uh, long, stand, long standing. So the first thing that we can do is to talk about the neutral water regions uh, so far, but I think we need to place more focus on the region um, south of the neutral water region. 
um, because we are currently removing barbed wires uh, from that uh, area. Uh, people could should be able to make it all the way there so that they can have a nice view of the Changhan wetland and other wetlands and beautiful scenery that you can enjoy from that point. And secondly, uh, just with those types of activities, uh, they are not enough. Uh, therefore, uh, although Dr. Nam talked about uh, various discussions that we could take, could pursue uh, to think about the things that could be accepted by North Korea, I think uh, we could suggest some uh, cooperation uh, for renewable energy development because we have vast uh, areas uh, that we could utilize along the West Sea uh, for the development of uh, renewable energy, and that could relieve the energy shortage uh, facing uh, North Korea. And at the same time, for the regions such as Hwanghe Province, Gyeonggi Province, Kimpo, and also some coastal areas in the West Sea, uh, those areas could uh, be covered by our future discussions with North Korea at the national level uh, with much more uh, concrete content. Uh, if we can do so uh, step by step, I believe that we should be able to advance our discussions for cooperation. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, Dr. Lee was very patient and waited all the way until uh, the end of the uh, second session. The Han River estuary is not uh, all that well known to us. Uh, because it's overshined uh, by the DMZ, but it does offer great value. And there are some initiatives that we can pursue right away uh, with the people. Especially, uh, this is all the more meaningful because we are talking about this in Paju City. Now, uh, we have time to take just one question from the floor. If you may introduce yourself first, and to whom is your question directed? Thank you. I am from the Kanghua District, Kyodong Island. So I live on this peace island surrounded by the Han River estuary. My name is Kim Young -e. I am also a peace activist. Now, listening to the presentations and the discussions, so all the discussions by the experts. So. I agree with what has been said, and also from the NGO and also from the local authorities and the central government. I see that there have been many efforts made already, so I appreciate that. But now one question is, now I am also researching the Han River estuary, but then now between the North and South Summit, and there have been a number of agreements, and they would come and then they would be halted. So now then the local residents, I mean, we have high hopes and then we are frustrated. So this has repeated itself a number of times. And also those uh, who have lost their home. So, for example, during the war, about 30,000 people from North Korea, they have come to the Kyodongdo Island. And now with the truce, with the armistice, now the they had to redraw the border and they came from what used to be South Korea but now it became North Korea territories and they were not able to go back and now the Kyodongdo Island now this is home to them and now they have a lot of sufferings and pain and memories and I believe that this can also be an important legacy because now I believe that the DMZ or the especially the Han River estuary, this is not just about the environment or the water but then it's also about the human efforts and also we have the seasonal birds in different seasons. But anyway, so then inside the green detente, then also the life of the displaced people and also their suffering, their sorrow and their experience, how can that also be incorporated into the storytelling? Because we also have good uh, records of them. So someone also talked about storytelling earlier, but so maybe we can also create a family history for each, but I hope that the government can also do this kind of storytelling or documentation of the storytelling, and maybe we can pass this on to the next government if this one is not successful. And I believe that this is something that we can do. Perhaps we can start from South Korean side.
Thank you very much. So that was Ms. Kim from Kyodongdo Island. Thank you for your comment. And yes, indeed, Kyodongdo Island. Now it is the region that symbolizes the pain of territorial division. You all know that they are famous for rice, so I hope that you will eat more uh, Kyodong rice. And we have about five minutes left in this session, and I would, of course, uh, like to give a chance to everyone, but I, please uh, bear with me that I'm not able to do so. So I would just like to give one minute to each of the four speakers. So to the speakers only, so I would give one minute, starting with Dr. Lee. Yes, thank you. I was also able to organize my thoughts even more so listening to the other presentations. And yes, I believe that uh, it was the point of the need to have organic cooperation among the different stakeholders. So not just among the institutions inside Korea, but also international organizations as well. And also in this process, now between the ecology, environment and tourism, and also for the Ramsar Convention, and also to utilize the agreement regarding the seasonal birds route, then there's also what's called the bird observatory tower. So we we could also utilize these ecological resources, and I believe that that is something that we can do at the international level as well. And also there is the cooperation corridor along this line as well. And also in terms of the local residents awareness and youth interest, in other words, in order to create a people's consensus, it is important. And I believe that this forum is all the more important in making that possible because we have also had the DMZ youth forum. So this would be a chance for us to further spread the awareness. Thank you. And yes, uh, Professor Frebel, are you also ready? One minute, please. I first visited South Korea 20 years ago. And it's incredible how fast the South Korean landscape changed. Uh, and the ceiling of the landscape, new highways and new towns and things like that. And I have the fear that the border area, especially the CC set, uh, that there, this development could also happen in the future. And so the question is, how green is the green peace zone? And I hope for a really sustainable way of development for the CC set and not the development uh, in the rest of uh, South Korea. That would be not a good way for the future of the CC set and the areas near the borderline. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Zhu Fang, are you still with us online? Are you ready? I'll make uh, one minute's uh, uh, response. I, I really like uh, all the uh, discussion for your wonderful idea. My conviction is always this. Uh, unless the uh, Cold War um, mentality and the Cold War, you know, the status quo could finally terminate it, then the DMZ were not just a hustle dismissed. But the problem is the current moment we needed to just embroiden ourselves into some sort of new course. The entire region has never been more, you know, intertwined and we are interdependent. So uh, don't keep the DPRK along. Let's just uh, uh, extend our warm hand and dragging the DPRK into the East Asia community. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments, uh, Dr. Nam. Yes, uh, not just the DMZ, but also all the other border areas. Uh, four of them are very important, and we have, we need to have a different strategies for each of those four regions. Uh, this is what I felt uh, by uh, participating in international organization activities. The ecological system that we have on the Korean Peninsula uh, is something that should be mutually beneficial to both Koreas, and that is an approach that we need to take. And this is a point that we need to emphasize to North Korea. Uh, this should not be leveraged as a tool to open up North Korea, whether it's the West Sea or the East Sea. The Green Peace Zone is something that we should be able to work together for jointly based on that basis. Thank you. 
The Ministry of Unification of Korea is hosting the Green Peace Zone DMZ Global Forum 2022, and this has been the second session of the forum. And um, this is uh, what I want to share with you. Uh, the Swedish scholar who spoke in the first uh, session quoted this, to be a realist, you need to believe in miracles. Uh, this quote has touched my heart. Given the current inter-Korean relations and the circumstances on the Korean Peninsula, uh, our initiative to turn the DMZ into GPZ is not an easy task. Uh, we are realists. However, despite the fact uh, for peace on the Korean Peninsula and for uh, the future uh, of peace on the Korean Peninsula, that dream, uh, our aspirations, is not something that we can ever abandon. With that, let me close the second session. Thank you. Thank you very much. A big hand, please, once again, to the moderator as well. Thank you, indeed. Yes, so it just felt bad that we were not able to have more time. We were able to once again think about the meaning and implications for DMZ and also the Greenpeace Zone. So many of the questions that we have had about the DMZ, I would say, have been answered in many parts and also give us food for thought on what we need to think about in terms of the future of the DMZ. And there was also one message from the online participant. Uh, we need greater sense of responsibility. Yes, so with great sense of responsibility over the DMZ, we are all gathered here today. And I hope that we will be able to further muster our sense of responsibility and try to find a better future together.